recording. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the February 16th, one o'clock meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, in my role of chair, I have to first make sure that everyone can see, hear, and be heard uh, because we're doing, conducting this meeting by Zoom and we are recording the meeting. So I will just call out names as I see them on my screen. Farah? Here. Mandy? Present. Pam? Present. Alex? Present. Irv? Present. Thank you. Um, we are missing one member who, uh, Jennifer, who notified us in a Advance that this is a long-standing this time slot once a month that was in conflict. Um, so I, th I think Sean will move right through. I, I just before we started officially started the meeting, I told everyone we posted the minutes from last week. And Pam took them, so I do need someone to volunteer. Um, and we just posted them yesterday, Alex. They went into the, they're, but they're online. So if anyone sees anything that I read and, and made a few minor edits, but if anyone sees anything, we can always correct them later. But I need someone to volunteer for minutes for this week. And Pam's were done in Word, and we can send you that Word document because it's kind of a constant format that we're using, and it's easy then just to set it up. So is there a volunteer for minutes for this week? Thank you, Alex. Alex raised her hand. Okay, Alex, we have a, a volunteer. You know, we have, however many meetings we have, we're gonna have to have minutes for each. And it's hard for me to take minutes, otherwise I would volunteer. Um, so Sean, when it, we, we're doing first the large capital improvement plan, the whole document, and you're planning about an hour on that, mm -hmm. and then we're switching to the resident proposals. Um, is that correct? Yeah, so I think we should, um, I've let resident requesters know that they have the opportunity to begin at two o'clock um, to present their project. So I think we should, um, I anticipate it'll probably take 20 minutes or so to go through the capital improvement program, maybe a little bit longer. Um, then we'll have time for questions. And then I think we should try to stop at two and do the resident capital requests. And then if there's time after and there's still questions to be um, addressed, we can come back to the to the capital, the full program after. Okay, and you had said some, but not all might participate. And I see at least one in the audience now. Right. So I'll, I'll try to, we can both keep an eye on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I believe you're on. All right, so I'll share my screen in a second. So just again, some context, this is the um, preliminary FY24 cap capital improvement program. And I stress preliminary, meaning it's still very early um, in the process. The town manager has told May 1st to submit a final version. Um, and, so, and then there's still lots of meetings that will go on with department heads around their requests and so on. Um, so, you know, what we hope uh, to get from you is feedback, um, on the plan, things you think make sense, don't make sense, uh, priorities, and you'll uh, when we go through the plan. General, I think today is really a good opportunity for general questions on sort of the whole document, or or sort of the high level questions on uh, funding for capital and how how it's divvied up. Uh, if you have specific project questions, um, you can ask them if if you want to. Uh, we will have department heads come the next three weeks and present their specific projects, and they're probably the best to answer um, questions that are specifically related to. Uh, to those projects that they've submitted. Um, but with that, I will share my screen and start going through it. So while Sean's bringing it up, the other practice, Pam, this is for you as well, is if there are specific project questions, if you send it to Sean in, in advance of them yep. discussing, they will come prepared to answer. You don't have to do that, um, but that's a way of also expediting. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so um, I won't go through a lot of the, sort of the preliminary um, information that we talked about last time. And this is all sort of process to help the community understand uh, sort of what's what's in the capital plan and how the process works. But you are all experts at this point for the most part. So uh, here's the pie chart, updated pie chart that sort of divvies up or shows how the allocation of um, how, how the allocation of funds 
are assigned to each department. Uh, public works is usually on the larger side because of the money that goes into roads each year between the chapter 90 money and then the whatever additional amount we put into roads and sidewalks tends to make deep uh, public works highway the, the larger section, one of the larger sections. So going to the process for this year, we looked at this a little bit um, at our last meeting. There has been one change that I'll update this document and um, I've updated the, the meeting postings. Uh, the fire department and the rec department are gonna swap places uh, just for availability issues for the, um, for the department heads that are coming to speak to those projects. So uh, recreation will go on March 2nd and the fire department will go on March 9th. Um, but other than that, the, the schedule is in pretty good shape. All right, so that brings us to our summary. So again, we went through last year's uh, version of this at the last meeting. So this has been updated. What you'll see is that we are proposing 10.5% uh, of the levy for capital. So we've achieved our goal of 10%, um, but we did have discussions during planning for the four building projects about going above 10% um, as part of the plan to how we can accomplish all four. Uh, so we are proposing 10.5% for FY24 at this point, and that equals 6.2 million. Um, other revenue sources outside of cash capital that are included in the plan as of right now, uh, 443,460 from the Community Preservation Act, specifically for debt uh, related to CPA projects. Um, again, that's an, a number that comes in as a revenue source and then goes out. So it's really a wash um, with, with um, some expenses down below. Uh, Comcast funding, we have a, a contract with Comcast where we get so much money every year of the, that contract. Um, and it's $75,000 and specifically targeted for the municipal fiber project that is almost complete. I would say it's uh, most 90% uh, of the way done. Um, hopefully in the next few months, it'll be completely wrapped up, but the debt for that project will continue. Um, and that's what this revenue source is for. Uh, other primarily includes funds from the ambulance, uh, our ambulance fund, which when our EMTs go out on a call, uh, we bill insurance, um, and, or we bill the, the individual utilizing the service and possibly insurance. Um, and so those funds go into an ambulance fund that we can then appropriate for costs associated with that service. And so it's usually used for staffing uh, in the department, but it's also used for some of the equipment and capital that they use. And then lastly, state aid. Uh, this is uh, just Chapter 90 money at this point from uh, the state that's earmarked for roadway improvements. Uh, we are proposing uh, $725,000 of borrowing uh, related to one project, and I'll show you which one that is. Uh, so that's all on the resource side, and then you can see in the out years what it looks like as we go forward. And then down below where the expenditures are, so we start with our debt, the, the, the debt associated with projects that have already been approved. So for FY24, we're estimating that at $1.3 million, that $1 million number. Um, we include projected debt below that. Right now, the only projected debt we have for FY24 that would actually kick in in FY24 um, is interest related to our bond anticipation notes. So every year, any projects that are in progress or we have to borrow on a short-term basis, we have to make interest payments on those short-term notes. Um, so we sort of have a, a recurring amount that we budget for that. Um, if it's not spent, it just uh, closes out. So it can be used again the following year. And then new projects would be funds that would be um, would come from cash capital, so uh, would be paid for in cash in that particular year. And this would all come from the, the general fund resources that we have. Down below, you get into the other resources. So we have a line for debt exclusion that we'll talk about um, in a little bit. Other is, again, that ambulance uh, receipt fund. So it comes in as a revenue, and that goes out as an expense. And then state aid, same thing, comes in as a revenue source, and then the, there's an expenditure assigned to that revenue source. Um, so it's an in and an out. So at this point, the plan is about $260,000 overspent, which is not unusual for us to start out with a plan that has more wants than what we have resources for. And, and part of this process is to try to get our resources and our, and our needs in alignment for the upcoming year. Kathy? Yeah, I, I, I just... I... It's sort of a question comment because I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but the actual debt line um, mm -hmm. in the, below, there's this $1.7 million jump. 
and this is approved. So this, since we don't have the new CPA yet, is that largely the Jones Library coming online? Yeah, um, we'll see in the debt schedule in a, uh, at the end, but I believe that's the projection of the Jones Library debt coming online. Okay, so I just, so and that was number one. Then the um, projected debt, there's a second really big jump in FY26 going from 50 to 2.9. That is the DPW starting to be show up. Is that correct? correct? Yep. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. So and I just that's... want people to, to de interactive. And then the other thing I noticed is because these come in, in terms of what we have to look at, the amount left for everything else by 2026 drops to 2.8 and ish. And we've been spending almost that much on roads and sidewalks. So this is the everything else, right? This is any new vehicles, any capital repairs, roads and sidewalks, that last line called new projects, correct? And I mean, that line, you'll see in that year, there's a deficit. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So not only is it not very much, but we don't even have that much. <laughs> right. So I think that the general, that was a good segue into one thing I wanted to say, which is the way the four billion projects influence with this plan is obviously something that's continuing to evolve, especially for, for projects like the DPW, where, um, you know, there is no definitive site at this point. Um, uh, the fire department, the fire station as well, in terms of how that will be financed, there's I would say the pieces related to the four billion projects is something that will probably evolve the way it's uh, incorporated into this plan. Um, but you're right to on those two observations. The reason those jumps are there is because of the Jones Library. Um, that portion is already approved, which is why it's up in the actual debt section. Um, and then projected debt, it's the DPW because that the the cost for the um, other than some engineering fees, um, the cost for the DPW has not been approved yet by the council. Yeah, I only raise that because it's not affecting what we're focused on this year at all um but it's looking outward um yep. which affects no. which affects everyone in the committee in terms of their the schools what what's going to be left for schools what's going to be left for yes right. okay yep absolutely all right so um so we went through sort of the the current year again the current year has a um so, you know, reasonable amount of, uh, but not not overwhelming uh, deficit at this point of 260,000. So keep that in mind as you hear presentations from departments and as you look at the individual projects that we do have to carve uh, carve something out or reduce something, push it out in the future, um, or just, you know, the recommendation could be just to not do it. Um, so keep that in mind as you go through the, the pr presentations from departments. Um, and then as you see in the out years, I think the only other thing I'll mention, uh, Kathy, Kathy, since you um, raised the issues about the DPW and the library, um, the debt exclusion line. So again, that's an estimate for the uh, debt exclusion impacts of the school project right now. Um, again, it's all based on assumptions around interest rates and project costs. Um, but again, we wanted to include something so it's incorporated in this plan, but that has been updated for, um, if you look at the previous version, it was based on some old assumptions, This the previous plan. Um, but this plan has the updated assumptions as of what we project uh, presented to the um, finance committee last week and to the council previously. Any other questions on this summary? All right, I will keep going and we can always come back to this at a uh, future point if there's any other questions. All right, so in terms of the projects that are being proposed uh, for uh, FY24, so first section is facilities. Uh, the item of interior exterior maintenance ADA improvements, that's a recurring item uh, that gets adjusted year to year, but it's essentially it's the bucket of capital funding that's for projects that pop up throughout the year. Um, and so there's always things that are sort of emergency replacements or um, sort of, you know, deferred maintenance type things that our facilities manager uses this bucket of funding for. And when he comes, he can give you the sort of the expectations of how he would allocate these funds for FY24. Um, but all, again, it also includes ADA improvements and ex, uh, exterior maintenance improvements. The energy sustainability improvements, that's a, another recurring line item that is managed by our, our um, sustainability director, Stephanie Ciccarello. 
we started out at 100,000, decision made last year to up it up to uh, 200,000. This can be used for helping convert vehicles to um, electric or hybrid options. It can be used for um, things like the uh, solar studies or um, solar feasibility analysis. We uh, did something like that recently with um, a municipal building. So uh, she, again, Stephanie will speak to what her intentions are for this. Uh, what it seems to have been recently are using these funds to help implement strategies that are in the climate action and resiliency plan. Now that we have that plan, there's a number of strategies that are uh, specifically identified. And so um, I imagine it will be closely tied to that. Uh, the Bangs uh, Bang Center. So the second floor of the Bang Center was recently renovated. Part of it was recently renovated for Cress, um, but there's sort of a hard cutoff where the renovation ended. And so, and that was paid for with some of the grant funds that we have received for Crest. So about half of the second floor, if you've been up there to see uh, the new Crest department has been completely renovated. The other half is still old and um, not really usable in its current format. And so these funds would be um, to basically bring that section of the, of the second floor at the bank center in alignment with the Crest section. Uh, we have money for paving at the child care facility, which has been on the plan for a little while, uh, money for the Munson Memorial building to um, uh, do some work around the fire alarm system. Uh, the police station roof has been on there for a little bit. There's been some preliminary money for design, I believe, already approved, and this would be for any remaining design costs and the actual repair and replacement of the roof that's currently there. And as part of that, they would do an analysis of whether it, the current roof could support solar in the future. if. Um, if that's the direction they want to move in. Uh, 65,000, a new project that's popped up um, is replacement of the HVAC system at the uh, server and communications room. Uh, so you may remember uh, it was last year, the year before, there was a uh, replacement for the police station HVAC system. And so the police station has sort of a number of HVAC systems. There's one system for the entire building that does the majority of the building, but then the server and communications room had their own uh, systems and those systems have begun to fail and that server room is really sort of the heart of town operations and um, so it's on here it might come off because quite frankly it might be something that has to be done sooner um, so if you see it come off in the future it'll mean that it was done and, and we found another way to pay for it um, because it is sort of a, a really high uh, it's an urgent uh, need uh, kitchen renovation at the central fire station 30,000 so we've been trying to uh, chip away at some uh, improvements to the older facilities that we have, especially the facilities that are housing people 24 seven. Um, and so this is one that our facility managers talked about with the fire chief um, for making some improvements to the central fire station. And then the uh, boiler replacement at town hall. And there is a new um, uh, sort of blurb that we're including in all of our replacements of of heating systems where we are looking to replace those heating systems with options that don't rely on fossil fuels. So, um, so uh, we, the procurement we're doing for the HVAC system at the police station had that type of language. Um, and I imagine if this is approved, that this uh, the procurement for whoever will do the boiler replacement will also have that type of language. Kathy, um, just a quick question. I sent this in to you in advance, but the new. Um, uh, federal law that was passed on uh, inflation, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, has for the first time direct payment credits to municipalities when they move from fossil fuel to electric. So my question, and I don't need an answer now, is which of the things we're looking at might qualify? And if we pay in cash, it's a 30% direct credit. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's real money if it looks like they might be eligible. And so I know this has come up for the ele elementary school, but when you read it, it's for um, renovation repair. It's not just if you're building a new building and it's not tied to how efficient the actual building is. It's tied to um, the fact that you're moving from one source of HVAC to another. Um, so I, I just it's worth checking um, with Stephanie because um, it has a specific line for geothermal. So I don't know how much for um, air source pumps. Right. Okay, that's it. No, I that's a good point. I imagine that's a process we will become pretty 
um, uh, comfortable with because there are so many expenditures that we make that at least at this point seem to fit within the eligibility criteria for that new program. Um, so, you know, everything that's in that energy sustainability bucket, you know, depending, potentially could be, fall within that area. Um, uh, and you'll see there's you know some of the things we're doing with vehicles and so on. So I think that's something we'll get really comfortable with as you know more information comes out about how we actually submit for it on an annual basis. Um, and then there will have to be a discussion about how we use those, um, you know, assuming it goes as planned and we do get money back, we'll have to have a conversation around how we use the money that comes back. All right, so the next section is uh, information technology. So there's a couple sort of recurring requests here for just general improvements um, and replacements of uh, technology equipment that the uh, IT director can speak to what the plans are for the upcoming year. In fire, um, there are a number, again, they have a, a pretty good handle on their uh, replacement schedules for the equipment they use. Uh, so there's some things here that are planned to come out of uh, capital funds like the portable radios um, and then there's other things that are proposed that come out of the ambulance fund so if it says other that means that the plan right now is for it to come out of the ambulance fund because it's core to that ambulance operation uh, so the sort of that general equipment request and then the power loaders and stretchers and the EMS defibrillators um, and that EMS defibrillators is the the final year of a three-year lease uh, lease to own uh, that we started a couple years ago um, and then protective gear will come out of uh, the general fund budget. In the police department, there's a couple of new projects in there that are um, on the larger side. Uh, one is the upgrade of the console that the dispatch uh, unit uses up at the third floor of the police station. Um, it has to do with um, how they connect to their radios and the equipment they use. Again, uh, Mike Curtin will be able to speak in much more uh, detail to the specific need, but it is criti it's critical to the emergency operation up there that we get that console upgraded. Um, and then body cameras is a new request that came on from the police department. This uh, request would uh, purchase all the body cameras that would be needed. It would also replace the in-car video system that currently exists and it would replace it with a system that works in conjunction with the body camera. So it would be sort of a complete replacement of all the, the sort of camera systems that the police department uses uh, when they go out on calls. Um, and this, and one thing again, just to keep in mind as part of this is that there would likely be a significant ongoing operational cost uh, associated with this from the software and storage um, that goes along with it. All right, it's a little blurry waiting for it to fix itself here. Come on. Is it still it's a blurry on your screen? The um, PDF? Okay. Yeah. Let me see why it's, there it goes. Okay. Um, so next is the schools. Uh, so because of the process that Fort River and Wildwood are going through, um, we really focus capital at Cracker Farm and then most of the things that are being used at Wildwood and Fort River are sort of what we call district ongoing uh, capital needs. So things that fall into a bucket that can be used at any of the schools um, because they're really just trying to maintain those buildings until uh, we hopefully have a new facility. So for Crocker Farm, there's no request for this upcoming year. There were a few requests last year, like replacing the um, the gym and the the underlying HVAC, HVAC system there. Um, but you can see going out, there's some large projects on the horizon. So um, that also factors into that those debt numbers we were looking at. And then uh, for FY24, they have mostly recurring items like furniture replacement, school security, asbestos management. Um, they have a similar capital item like we have for interior or exterior upgrades and ADA improvements, which allows them to um, take care of projects as they pop up uh, if something breaks. Uh, they have a general bucket for HVAC replacements and improvements. Um, and then they have a few that are, uh, the other general one is the technology equipment. That's something that uh, Jerry Champagne, the IT director will come and speak to the, the specific equipment that's planned to be replaced there. Um, the new ones this year that jump out are the electric bus upgrade slash battery replacement and the non-school bus charging infrastructure. So right now the electric school bus, my understanding, the one we currently have, the E-Lion, um, has had some software interface issues. Uh, they're 
they need to fix those issues. And then there's also the, the battery is at the point where it's starting to degrade and might need, uh, they, they think needs replacement, but they need to fix the first issue first to determine whether it needs a, a battery replacement. Um, so that'll be a good one to get an update from Rupert, the facility and transportation director on the status of that bus. Uh, the other one, the non-school bus charging infrastructure, this is to put in a charging station um, in anticipation of shifting the other vehicles that the schools use to electric. Um, so the schools, in addition to school buses, operate a number of vans for um, preschool transportation um, and special education transportation. They also operate a number of maintenance vehicles. Um, and so it would be um, getting some charging infrastructure in anticipation of that. Um, and again, I'm sure Rupert will uh, be able to expand on that. Public works is the next section. Uh, so we went, one thing we changed this year is just, it used to be called transportation plan. I think there was some confusion around what exactly that was. So um, we've clarified that this transportation engineering, um, we put a recurring amount in there because every year there's projects that the um, public works department is asked to you know, come up with an engineering study about how to um, add a sidewalk or turn a you know a road that has no bike lanes into a road that has sort of all the things that you want in a new road. So, so that's what that money is for is a recurring amount. Some of that's done in conjunction with the um, Transportation Advisory Council and the work that they do. Next is the Stormwater Management Program. Um, that's a recurring amount um, as the DPW continues to implement some of the um, state and federal regulations related to managing our stormwater. Uh, for sidewalks, uh, we beefed that up to 200,000 a few years ago, and, and this proposal keeps it at that 200,000, um, but the plan always was in the future that it would have to come back down, and that's what you see in the future as we take on some of the costs of the building projects that that comes back down to a level where it was historically. Uh, same thing with roads. Uh, the next one, we, it's kept at a million, which is sort of the highest level we've brought it up to, uh, but you can see in the future, it, it drops back down. The other thing we've tried to do with roads is when we do have end of year surpluses within our operating budget. The last couple of years, we've tried to uh, make, you know, not recurring, but targeted investments to do more road work and more sidewalk work. Um, and I think that's something that will continue. Uh, asphalt Hotbox, this is a system that they use to do a lot of the patching. They have a current system that has, uh, it's like a asphalt recycler that's been breaking down. And, um, and so this would be a new system to help them do the patching that they do throughout town. Uh, the road repair resurfacing from state aid, same thing as the one above, but this is the piece that comes from Chapter 90 money. A new one that is um, this year that I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussion is the field maintenance equipment. So in response to all the conversations that happened around the track and field at the high school, um, you know, we had identified some equipment needs that would um, enhance the ability of the DPW to uh, do more with the fields there. Uh, so there's a couple different pieces of equipment that are included in this bucket that's for 315,000 um, that, that Guilford will go into more detail on, but um, this is specifically in response to that conversation. And then tree planting and removal support. Um, this one was expanded to include planting. And, and typically it's always been tree removal support in the past. We wanted the ability for this one to include the planting of new um, shade trees in the future. Um, we haven't done a large purchase of shade trees in a long time. Um, the last time they did it was before I came to the town and I think they did a actually did a borrowing of some sort to do a bunch all at once that they sort of spent down over time. Um, that's been fully expended. So there is, right, as far as I know, there's no money right now for the purchase of new shade trees. Um, so we wanted to expand uh, the scope of what this one could be used for. Uh, conservation, um, nothing requested for FY24. Um, planning, we started putting in a $50,000 recurring item for um, consultants or outside experts to come in and, and work on different projects that uh, the, the planning department is working on, usually aligned with what the council is doing. Um, so last year, this amount was used for doing an engineering of the Boltwood garage and also supporting the um, solar siting bylaw or the work of the solar siting bylaw. Um, and so going forward, um, uh, there's some village center planning and some other projects that are on the, uh, that Chris Brestrup will come and speak to or the planning director um, as to what they would use this for. Uh, nothing for Amherst Recreation uh, in terms of playgrounds for FY24. 
and we have done a couple major playground uh, projects in the last few years. Uh, Cherry Hill, there's a uh, two requests, one to improve that parking lot, which is in pretty rough shape. Um, that's one that's probably a good idea, regardless of what Cherry Hill is used for in the future, is to get that parking lot into a, a better shape when they have events like the, the, some of the, the winter fest things over there. Um, you know, there's some issues with potholes and bottoming out and things like that when you go in and out of there. And then the irrigation system, um, there the irrigation system that waters and supplies water to different parts of the golf course um, needs some improvements. Again, the uh, that Ray Harp will come and speak to you about. And then last but not least, uh, the vehicles. Uh, so I won't go through all these, but you can see um, Amherst Rec has requested a, a new vehicle. They use a, a van to um, transport equipment and materials from uh, from site to site, especially as they do different community engagement events or they do summer school um, and things like that. They need a way of uh, transporting their equipment. Uh, DPW has a number of vehicles um, in there. Again, I think one of the newer ones that's large, uh, I'm sure you'll you'll want to ask Gilford about is the sidewalk plow uh, for $200,000. My understanding is we have uh, one currently and we have another piece of equipment that sort of acts as a sidewalk plow, but really isn't intended for it. Um, and so uh, you can weigh in on that. Uh, when we get down to schools, you'll see a large number for electric school bus and charging infrastructure. So this is a, I think this is a, big discussion for this committee to have um, that we the schools received a grant that they applied for uh, I believe it's from the DARA program I don't have the acronym definition up, um, right at the second but um, the, but the grant is capped at two hundred thousand dollars and the schools uh, in the town would have to come up with the remaining share of that cost and so they estimated that between the school bus and the um, the new fast charging infrastructure that would have to be put in that that cost would be somewhere over $500,000. So the number that you see here is the cost with the roughly 100, it's a little bit less than 200,000, I think, subtracted out. And, and again, so the question, we have time if this, this project can go through the regular process for approval, we don't have to rush the approval um, of this uh, school bus, but the, um, I guess the question is, is this the best way to use $373,000 um, towards sustainability improvements? It's one of those sort of, questions I always have and I'm always talking with Stephanie about is we know our resources are, are very um, limited. How do we make sure we're using the funds in a way that has the greatest impacts? And so that's just, I think it's something that this committee should weigh in on is, um, you know, is that a, the project we should be moving forward? I see Farah has her hand up, Sean. Um, Sean, just a quick question about the school bus. Are, are mm -hmm. we talking about all the elementary schools or the middle or all the schools or this and how for, will that be affected yeah. by the school project so this would be for one bus okay yeah so this would be to buy one replace one of our um, diesel buses with an electric bus okay um so and, um so there if we with the school configuration i'm not sure how that um you know, will that result in any changes in the, the way the transportation system works for the schools? But um, but in this particular case, this is just to replace one single diesel bus with an electric bus. We already have one electric bus that's offline currently, but this would give us a second one. Thank you. Mandy? Yeah, um, I, I think that I'd, I'd like to follow up on that, but I had that question with a number of the school charging infrastructures and all that I think we need to have them prepared to come answer, which is, how much of this infrastructure is, and where is the infrastructure going to go? How and um, and for the buses and the vehicles, uh, is it are they solely used by the elementary schools or are they shared by the region? And if they're shared, and if the infrastructure is going to be on region property, not elementary school property, uh, and also with this field equipment stuff, the maintenance equipment, um, what is what portion of these costs are the region picking up? Um, versus handing it all to just Amherst. Mm -hmm. I know you probably can't answer that now, but that's something no, that they it, it's need a to good, come prepared to answer. It's a good question. And it, you know, again, it kind of relates to the the system that we currently have for maintaining the fields. If that request was to come from the region and they did all their own field maintenance, 
like you said, it would go through the regional capital process, which the other towns would um, contribute to because it came through the DPW who ultimately handles the, um, who ultimately handles the field maintenance sort of at the larger scale, like we're talking about. Um, it doesn't go through that process, but it is a good thing for us to think about more and, um, and just how it would work. Kathy? And just for the same thing I said up above, electric school buses and charging stations are specifically on the list of possible federal credits. Um, and to add to Mandy's, um, I've actually been wondering when you have a charging station, the elect electrical cost that you're using goes back on the bill of, I think, the sponsoring entity. So it's either going back onto an elementary school budget or onto a regional school budget. So trying to sort that out and if they're available to the public at all, or are these just for school vehicles. So it, it's it, when when people come in, like those are going to be clusters of questions. And the biggie is if there's help in buying these from the federal government as well as it changes the equation a little bit of what these look like. Yeah. I, so I don't know. It doesn't necessarily change the amount we have to ask for, um, but right. it could change. A, it could create a future revenue source for the money we get back. Um, and again, if, if the decision is made that that money would go into capital, um, it could create a potential new funding source in the future. Um, and then just in generally, most of the school transportation vehicles are housed at the middle school, um, just because that's where the transportation and central offices are housed. Um, so I believe they're all connected to the middle school electrical system. Um, and they do already have, I believe, a, a charging station that is there that is open to the public. Um, so I'm not sure this one that they're proposing would be, but but they do have one currently. But again, I'm sure uh, Rupert will be able to expand on all that. And when, when Guilford comes in, when DPW comes in with their, with their vehicles, can you make sure he tells us which of these is replacing what on the current sure. inventory list? And, you know, so the, na the names are general enough. I don't know whether I'm matching it with the 10 year old vehicle or um, hope and okay. I'll, I'll wait till we get to your next table because I think in the summary table that Mandy asked for, I think you have an undercount of DPW vehicles based on the longer list of all of them. Yeah, it's not an undercount. Um, it is only the general fund ones because the costs above are only general fund costs. So I was going to note that when we get there that it doesn't include the ones that are owned by the enterprise funds. Um, so again, it might be a further enhancement we make in the future, but that's why it doesn't include all of them is because the the maintenance costs above are only for the general fund. Okay, Ir Irv's hands up. Irv? Uh, in relationship to the electric bus, uh, what I'm not clear on is whether this grant has already been accepted uh, by the schools. I, I, I'm not sure of that. Uh, if it has already been accepted by the schools and that bus is there, uh, then the infrastructure, if the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure isn't put there, put in place, then uh, that is something that would be problematic uh, because the bus would not be to operate without the infrastructure. Right. So the grant, I believe, is for both. Um, I think you. I think both have to be part of the the project, is to put the infrastructure and the bus in at the same um, around the same time. We have accepted the grant because we did not want to lose the opportunity. But I did check with the granting authority that if we don't appropriate the funds, then the grant would just go away. Um, but we didn't want to lose the potential or the option to move forward with the grant. So we have accepted it. Um, and and I think that, any did that answer your questions, sir? Yes, it did. The other thing is, uh, when I look out at 25 and 26, it's rather uh, disturbing mm -hmm. in terms of these numbers. Yeah, especially again because of the the bringing in the uh, Ford with the DPW and the Jones Library, it really, um, you know, as we expected, it, it puts a crunch on what we have available for other capital. And then you add in that uh, the other thing that is not as um, 
is not as visible, but lots of these things have increased in cost, uh, especially on the vehicle side. Um, we've done sort of an initial update of these to reflect the rising costs for vehicles. So you'll see the, the cost for cruisers went from you know 60,000 per vehicle up to 75,000 vehicle to reflect partially the hybrid technology, but also just the fact that cruisers are more expensive. Same thing with the DPW vehicles, um, same thing with the fire station vehicles, everything really, um, and, the, and the school vehicles. So really all the vehicles have been up dated to what their current prices are, which went up substantially. And that also uh, 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 took away some of the resources we had available. Um, so just finishing up, uh, the police department has four cruisers proposed, again, $75,000 a piece, that would be hybrid cruisers. Um, the, uh, and then in the fire station, the first one that's proposed there is a uh, new ambulance that's proposed to come out of the ambulance uh, receipt fund. So again, that wouldn't come out of our general fund revenues, it'd come out of this um, other uh, funding source. The pumper truck is the one project that's being proposed for borrowing. So for whatever reason, we bought all our fire vehicles about 20 to 25 years ago. Uh, and so they're all sort of coming due for replacement, um, you know, starting with the ladder truck. I think we, we recently approved the pumper truck. And then there's a few more that were all sort of bought a couple years apart um, that are coming due. And so that's, uh, and they've gotten substantially more expensive. That's the other problem. Uh, so that one's proposed for a borrowing because of the, the cost. And then the all-terrain vehicle is the vehicle that they would use um, for rescues on a trail or, or something that's off, you know, off-road um, that they would use to transport somebody back um, from, from that location. All right, um, I'm not gonna go through all the descriptions because I kind of did a brief overview. Any questions on the individual projects that have been submitted? Um, so far. So again, all these projects uh, came from department heads. Generally, um, I'll be adding the form, the project forms to the packets um, probably tomorrow morning. And so you can see a little bit more about what the department head said about the project and, and the need for it. All right. Uh, so our pending list, it's mostly the same as last year with a few um, adjustments. So uh, we have Puffer's Pond is a big one that was on there um, that we continue to seek alternative funding. Finishing the Kendrick Park design is a big one on there. Um, North Amherst intersection. Uh, a new one that's been added is building demolition. So we have a number of facilities that we eventually need to demolish buildings um, that we will need to money to do so, uh, starting with Hickory Ridge and that uh, the clubhouse, uh, the VFW site that was recently acquired, and then also uh, the gas station that is behind the North Amherst Library um, is on town land. And we've been, uh, the tank, the oil tank has already been removed. The, the tank that holds all the fuel has been removed, um, but the sort of the shell of the gas station still remains. Kathy? Um Sean, I, I know this is the future list, but on building demolition, if there's any useful wood in either Hickory Ridge or the um, the golf thing or the, there probably isn't anything in the gas station. One of our neighbors found a person that if, if they let them take the wood away, they did most of the demolition for free and, oh, okay. then, and then left the trash part, you know, the stone in the cement part, so substantially lowered it because the wood was decent, but but he had a barn, okay. you know, so, so it may be. And I told this to Dave Zomack, and I, but just as a reminder, yeah. um, so that makes that's, sense. That's it lowered the cost a bit. I see Pam's hand is up. Yeah, I had a quick question on the um, Kendrick Park design and construction. Is this to complete the intersection at McClellan and uh, North Pleasant Street, or is it actual park? The park looks fairly completed. Yeah, so there was a concept for the other side of Kendrick Park that um, included sort of a performance area, um, I think some additional sidewalks around, um, uh, you know, where. Uh, there's always been talk about a downtown bathroom and things like that. So there was another piece to that concept and that's what this would be for. I'm not sure if it would do any um, intersection work. Uh, that's something that Guilford would know for sure when he comes in. Thank you. Just related, Sean, I just want to have a follow-up. Um, 
I don't know to what extent our committee wants to do this, but in terms of priority for the things that's on, a, if grants come through and what to apply for grants for, the one that I mentioned last week is uh, intersection mm -hmm. grant near the Fort River School. Um, and we've, we're not, I'd like to put that on the list. And then I want to question whether that wouldn't have a higher priority to seek money for that than the Kendrick Parker design. Because I'm worried that sometimes we go out for grant money because it's there and then we have to spend half of it. And maybe it wasn't our highest priority and no one likes to turn grant money down. Um, so if we really say that the intersections are critical and they're critical for getting around safely or for the new developments that are coming in. So this is long-term capital planning, but that's partly what we're supposed to be weighing in on, I think. So I would just try to find some point where we, if we put something in this report, we could have a longer discussion or, you know, 10 minute discussion about it, not yeah. long. Kathy, just to clarify, are you talking about the existing intersections or a, um, possibly a new something at well, the entrance to Fort River? Well, not at the entrance at the the two traffic lights. Um, Guilford raised that roundabouts would work at them, and then closing out the way the road slices through where that little mm -hmm. bank is. Yep. So not stopping that, and we don't have the money to do that. But two new developments are coming in there, and there is a grant we got for sidewalks, but there, it didn't do the intersections. So those are a problem with or without the school, um, the way the traffic flows. So I just. North Amherst is a different kind of problem, you know, so it's just, um, this seems to dictate what, what grants people are applying for. So it's, it's, a, it is a priority list for staff time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, this list in itself is not, it's not in order or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I know what I you're really saying. Like if, it, if it's on the list, it's something that we're, um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll make a note of that. Um, so when Pam other... asked about Kendrick Park, I would rank it yeah. so much lower that I might take it off the list altogether in terms right. of um, we've got a terrific playground right there and let's move elsewhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> but okay. Yeah. The other thing that might again, help with something like what you described or just help generally in the future is, uh, hopefully we will start seeing some increased transportation money from the, the surcharge. Um, again, we don't, haven't as of today heard anything new about how that money will flow through to cities and towns, but, um, I anticipate that it will impact this capital plan at some point, um, you know, one of the, some, in some way. All right, so the next section are projects that are uh, require more development and analysis work um, and funding, but are, are a little bit more in the planning phase. Um, most of these, again, have been on there uh, since last year. I'm trying to see if there's any, I think the, I think the only new one that was added is the uh, homeless shelter because we now own the, the VFW site. I think everything else was there from last year. So here's the um, asset table. We added um, something about the number of vehicles, so, which just comes directly from the, the inventory sheet in the back. Again, Kathy, you noted that the public works number was low compared to the inventory sheet. And again, it's because I wanted the number to align um, with the numbers above. So you could kind of get some scale uh, when you look at them. But um, I'll take a look. I'll rethink about it. If there's a way we can incorporate the enterprise fund ones so it ties out better. And just uh, so people know, when I counted, I got nearer to 60 vehicles. So it just, uh, you know, I did a rough count. So, yep. Mandy, you were the one who asked to have this line added. Um, and to me, I think it matters because these some of the vehicles are used interactively, regardless of who, where they were. They're all parked in the same place. <laughs> so, yeah. The schools, okay. we added the schools. You can't really do it by school because obviously it's sort of a district transportation. So it's sort of lumped all together. Um, but you have the number for the schools and the big number here is their their contract, their transportation uh, budget for um, for that service. Alex? Alex has her hand up. I'm sure you'll be shocked at my forever, every single year. Are you gonna add the North Amherst Library to the list of town assets since it belongs to the town? Um, I think... We will. Um, I know there's obviously there's the run uh, the addition project going on, and and there's going to be some discussion after that project about sort of maintaining that building, especially since it will include some community space going forward. Um, You're doubling the size of it and the cost of it. Yeah. No, yeah. Not, so I, just, I, just, I I worry every year that I mean 
it was sort of lost at some point that the town owned that building. And mm -hmm. I just worry, I don't want it to get lost again. So I yeah. feel like if we are clear that it is on the list, nobody forgets that the town owns it and then people don't get confused. All right. Well, well, since the list had to go to a second page, I need to add at least three or four more columns so that it's, it's uh, I like, I like balance. I don't like the sort of half table here. So we need to add three or four more buildings just to get it to balance out. Right. But um, yeah, I, I, I bet seriously, I think in the next year or two, we'll see that go on because some decisions can be made how to, how that building's maintained. Mandy. Similarly, is there a reason why North Fire Station and Central Fire Station are listed on the same column? Yeah, because we don't break out um, the accounts for those two facilities. We don't separate like the heating fuel account. It's, it's all within the fire department's budget. Um, so we don't have a good way as of right now to, uh, to break them out. So could I ask then how the square footage, is it like, is 26,668 the square footage of both buildings combined? Yeah, yeah, we could do something similar in the future, like I'll, when we look at the schools in a second, you know, schools have some building based accounts, but then they have some accounts that are district and for those district ones we parsed it out by square footage. Um, we theoretically could do something like that with the North and Central Fire Station, uh, but that but just that's why they're one because there's not separate accounts right now. Okay, thanks. And does that answer my question why DPW seems to have such a small square footage that you're not counting the square footage there? I think there's more than this. And then my second question is, at least when we're doing the school building, we've been told the square feet of Fort River and Wildwood is 82,000 and you've got 108. So I'm yeah. just... I'm so just some, so, yeah. yeah, so these square footages come from the assessor's um, card. And so yeah. sometimes there's a difference between sort of effective space versus total uh, square footage of a of a building so that's probably why the difference is there okay. um, with public works yeah this is of again it's from the assessor's card for the headquarters which i try to note there it doesn't include all the the space that they have like tree and grounds and some of the other facil off-site facilities that they have okay thank you um so we did have at the schools, you know, hours of operation per week, something I sort of ballparked is probably, I'll, I'll check in with Mike and Doug, that number might need to get tweaked up because they'd certainly use it a lot. It's just not consistent every week from week to week how much it's being used. Um, for their number, so again, they have custodians that are charged directly to their buildings, but then they have district maintenance staff that are not. So for anything that was sort of a district maintenance shared cost, I just prorated it by square footage at the building but there's a lot of stuff they have that is charged directly to schools, like their heating, fuel, and electricity and things like that. So um, so I'd say it's a pretty good representation of the way the costs are allocated. But again, because we're doing that allocation by square footage, it's not exact. Kathy? Oh, sorry. I meant to take it down. Oh, Mandy Jo? Yeah, um, I just wanted, you kind of just explained this, the personnel services, exactly what personnel goes into that number. Yeah, so it's Cross uh, all the lines. so each school um, has three or four custodians, um, which are in that line, and then um, and and that's the same thing with the other buildings that there if there's custodial support assigned directly to the building, it's included there, um, and then the um, there's a number of um, specialists at each school or in the district, such as an electrician, plumber, HVAC. Um, when they can find people to fill those positions, those positions are really hard to fill right now. Um, those costs are are in there, and then the drivers. Um, one of the benefits of our transportation system is that we employ a lot of our drivers, and so in the morning, and the afternoon, they drive, and during the middle of the day, they do a lot of maintenance and repair work um, and grounds work uh, throughout uh, our school properties, um, and so the. Uh, we break out what is transportation versus what is maintenance with those employees. Um, so the maintenance portion is what's what you see here. All right, keep going on. So um, status of approved projects. Again, these updates, we've gotten some updates. I think this is, again, a section when department heads come and speak. Um, you know, they can provide the most recent update on how, how these projects are going. You can see the department and then what the specific project is that they're working on. And these are all things that are three years or older. Um, so FY20 and before. Um, 
And this is sort of the summary of what is capital. And I'm going to wrap up in four minutes because I know it went way longer than I was expecting. But I think we got through a lot of questions as we went, which is good. Um, so inventory, uh, facility inventory, um, we try to highlight the buildings that are work is being done to or they're scheduled for replacement or so on. Um, we added a couple of the new facilities like the V, um, I think we have the VFW site. Uh, not yet actually, sorry, that was too new. We added the Hickory Ridge uh, site and the Belchertown Road parcels that were purchased recently. So those are on there now. Um, and then I'm sure we'll, the VFW site will be added on uh, before it's finalized. And then as we go to vehicles, so we tried to organize this a little better than in previous years. Again, we removed the um, non-vehicle equipment that was on here, like all the trailers, which we thought made it look easier to kind of understand how many actual vehicles a department has. Um, we also tried to standardize some of the language so you could, um, you know, how many ambulances does the fire department have or how many dump truck plows does the DPW have? Uh, so, so that's been updated. The dark orange are the vehicles that are slated for replacement with the requests that have been submitted for FY24. The um, light orange are vehicles that already have funding approved uh, and will be replaced. We're just waiting for the vehicles to come in or for the, the procurement process to complete and for the vehicles to come in. And then the highlighted green are the vehicles that have some sort of hybrid or um, uh, sustainable technology already incorporated. And so the goal there is hopefully this list will become more and more green as we continue to swap out um, older vehicles with the newer vehicles that are generally we've been uh, able to find, being able to incorporate some sort of hybrid technology into our newer vehicles. Pam? Um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the ladder truck that I think we just spent a whole lot of money for. Oh, that's yeah. replacement value, excuse me, not, not um, but we just replaced that. This uh, Simon ladder? Yeah. Yeah, so the, another change we made is the replacement values in the past were all over the place. Um, so I worked with department heads a little bit to try to standardize the replacement values and update them to the true, like, not if it get, uh, what if we had to go out and buy a new one? And so these replacement values are supposed to better reflect the real cost of these vehicles going forward. Um, so that's why that one, um, that, so that's why that's at 1.6 million because that's roughly what it costs now for a new ladder truck. Um, let me, sorry, it's, I'm not sure why it's taken so long to. See, I can get this to not be so blurry. There's just a lag, I think, because the file's so big. I until I downloaded it to my yeah. All right. All right. So so I'll go through and I'll just try to wrap up with the debt schedule. See if I can get that to pop in. All right. So the um here's the updated debt schedule. So again, the shaded gray are the approved projects and are um, for ones that have already been financed it's the exact debt schedule for ones that are um, we haven't actually purchased yet we have a projected debt schedule there um, some of these debt schedules for things that we haven't um, acquired yet we've had to push out farther than we expected so for example um, the pumper truck uh, uh, we we're probably gonna have to push this out another year it's not done here but i think we're gonna have to push this out to fy25 because we don't start paying the debt until we receive the vehicle and everything's taking longer to receive. Uh, so uh, the facility chiller, we pushed out another year and, and some of these other ones are gonna get pushed out as it takes longer to get them. The shaded yellow area is the projected debt. So projects that have not been approved yet, but are on the plan as uh, a borrowing. Um, bond anticipation, no interest. You'll see that's high or that um, that's sort of a recurring amount. You'll see these two high years in FY. 26 and 27, that's related to the Jones Library project and our debt schedule and just um, sort of the financing costs of that project and how we anticipate it'll um, having some higher short-term financing costs for that. Uh, in the light blue are the CPA projects, so you can get a better sense of uh, the amounts that are in that debt number on the summary sheet. It's for these projects that were approved for debt. So these are only the debt-funded CPA projects. 
Uh, we have the regional debt assessment, which I've updated um, based on the presentation from the regional school committee at the four town meeting um, through FY26. Mandy, you asked a question last time and, you know, whether we would go all the way up to what they've, what they're showing or what we, we would cap it. Um, for now, we're keeping it at 800,000, not to say that it would never go above that, but um, I think for this committee to know the regional school committee has submitted a, has put together a regional capital plan that goes far above 800,000 uh, in the future between um, if, if they were to do every project that's on their plan. Um, we put in the debt for the enterprise funds just so you have a sense of what's there, uh, building projects that would be funded by debt. Um, the reason you don't see the fire station on here is because the current plan for the fire station is to not finance it, is to try to build up our reserve so we can um, not have to borrow for that project. Um, but that's still a decision that will be, you know, still has to be finalized. And then just some total information. And so with that, I will stop. So Kathy, we do have a number of um, resident requesters in the audience. Is it okay if we transition to that? Yes. I should ask the rest of the committee, are we okay to move to the next section? Yes. So I'll just ask if you are here to um, speak to a resident capital request, can you raise your hand? Perfect. All right, so we are gonna start, um, uh, Kathy, I was gonna just go in the order in which the resident capital requests were submitted. Yep. Okay, so Ira Brick is here and I'm gonna bring, them in. So Ira, when I, I'm going to promote you to a panelist, it's going to pop up something that you have to accept in order to be brought in. There you go. Uh, so Ira, go ahead. Um, and uh, I think we talked about, you know, three to five minutes for uh, to kind of talk about your request. Um, I believe yours was for uh, charging uh, chargeable or bike station charge bike charging stations. And Ira, you need to unmute. Good. Yeah, we can yes. hear you now. Okay, so I'm Ira Brick from 255 Strong Street. And this is my resident capital request for consideration by the town's joint capital planning committee. I propose that part of the funding be used to create a locked and guarded bicycle parking area in the town lot off North Prospect Street with places to charge e-bikes. There could be a cost to park a bicycle and also to charge an e-bike or e-motorcycle. This small facility could be solar powered and I'm told that if it's self-contained, it would not be nearly as noisy as our solar arrays that transfer and store electrons. There might also be some parking spaces to charge electric cars. This location would create easy access to the central business district and be a much less intense use than the proposed three to five level parking garage for that location. That garage could be located elsewhere if past and current studies show that downtown Amherst doesn't need another parking garage. Plus, my proposed use is less disruptive to the historic neighborhood there, as well as to the CVS customers who often park behind the store. I'm told that during construction of a large garage there, we would need the CVS lot to be used for staging, and that might result in the loss of CVS downtown, as they are very attached to their own parking behind the store. Informal studies by neighbors in that area have reported that the North Prospect lot is usually underutilized, often largely empty, even during peak times for Amherst Cinema and the Drake and downtown restaurants. I believe this use would be a higher and better one, even if it is lower and simpler. And it would be great marketing for Amherst, a town that supports reduced use of cars and increased use of electric vehicles, including e-bikes, becoming greatly more popular, especially by older people who have a hard time riding traditional bicycles in our hilly region. I don't think this would be especially costly to construct and would have an income stream to offset those initial costs. Thank you. So Kathy, do you wanna do questions after each presentation or do you wanna do questions at the end and I can send them out to requesters if- um, um, 
I, I guess I'll ask the committee. I mean, if we can ask them right now, if they're not answerable right now, then we can get written requests. You know, so how would people like to do it? Um, Pam. I wouldn't mind being able to ask a quick question or two after every one, just because yeah. I won't be able to remember. Okay, so I, I think why don't we do that and then we we'll say we're not expecting we'll get them all answered right now and we could get answers back unless they are easy to add. So, so Pam. I, have, I have my hand up. Um, I don't if if Ira Burt could describe what he means by guarded. I understand lockable, but what do you mean by guarded station? Well, I think the result of it being guarded could come from not being uh, manned or womaned. Um, you know, if there were places to lock it securely, but rather than just have a bike lock, a bike rack where anybody can snip it with a bolt cutter, it would be more secure since my e-bike costs $3,500. Um, that's a big trust issue to just leave it in an insecure place. So I'm just looking for my question is you put a rough estimate of twenty thousand dollars. Did you have anything to base that on? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But I imagine this could even be a temporary, you know, if there was a higher and better use than that, it is a residential and historic district. So even if this lot was there for 10 years and then somebody came up with another idea, it wouldn't be like taking down a five-story parking garage. Okay, Mandy. Yeah, um, a, a couple of them. Uh, what's the size you're, you're thinking about? Um, so how many bikes would it hold? Things like that. How tall would it be? Is it gonna be covered? Things like that. What are your thoughts on that? Um, and um, why a spot that doesn't already, you know, this this lot doesn't have charging infrastructure at it already, whereas we have two town lots that already does do have charging infrastructures, Prey Street and behind the town hall. So why not those lots? Why this one that doesn't already have the infrastructure? Are the lots you're talking about good for charging bicycles? No, they, they already have electric vehicle charging infrastructure, right, which presumably not... means they have electric infrastructure that you could hook into for bikes too, well, and, more and easily e than a lot that has no charging infrastructure. Well, so, I mean, first of all, that is a little remote. My personal habit and other people I know, they don't park their e-bike out of sight. And this is just a little closer and a little bit more secure. I wouldn't want to park my e-bike and walk away from it. Um, and then also what I imagine is the structure is similar to the UMass one near the visitor center where the solar collector would also be a roof and then there would be some kind of fencing with locks, maybe bring your own lock or something like that. But um, I also think that this location is good for people that are using downtown closer than Prey Street or behind Town Hall. Thank you. I admit to not being scientifically knowledgeable about how this would work. So I wrote just to follow up on Mandy's and you don't have to respond to this, but if if the issue of where it was mattered, but the idea is attractive, would you want to keep the idea on the table? You know, well, I think it's a I think it's a good idea. Yeah. I, I have a lot of people uh, who live in Amherst or in Northampton. I have a friend in Northampton that e-bikes to North to Amherst every day. I think it would be good for the downtown. I yep. do prefer this location because it's two birds with one stone uh, where there's a lot of people that live in that uh, neighborhood on North Prospect that are saying, you know, we don't want this gigantic garage in our backyard of a historic local, a local historic district. Okay. Mandy, is your hand up again oh. or just not down? It's Alex. Um, I'm don't know if anybody knows. I assume there would have to be a study done. So I'm assuming the the twenty thousand in theory. I don't know if that's study like your estimate on study plus construction costs, or if that's to, so. I guess you didn't. I know you said to Kathy you didn't have a basis for it, but I'm just trying to understand. Um, I totally guessed on the twenty thousand dollars. I don't know what it would cost. It could be much less, but yes, I agree. It would need to be a study. There would need to be some grading of the lot, which now seems like it's just the Baja there and um 
you know, there's already been some studies about a garage there, I think. Maybe that's not true, but maybe some of that information would help here too. And Alex, just, um, and Kathy asked us before the meeting, um, we do anticipate getting some input from uh, department staff that we can share with the committee as well. So that's a question I can um, okay. relay to them. Uh, so like Stephanie Ciccarello will probably want to weigh in on this and I'm sure Guilford will have some thoughts uh -huh. on it. I also think it's good marketing for the town. You know, I think this would make national news, actually. So I, All right. I think that it's a good set of questions, Sean. I took notes, too, so we can okay. keep them. All right, I'm going to bring in our next Thank uh, requester. Thank yeah. you, Ira. Thank you so much, Ira, for sending the request. Um, Robert is our next requester. Bob, you're with us if you, I think you're with us if you unmute. Yep. But you're not unmuted. No, I am. Excuse yeah, me. I, I've toggled it. Good to see you guys. I, most of you I know for a long time. Alex, nice to meet you uh, in person, sort of. Sean, I've known. Anyway, um, just I, I realized that I, I'm following on a request that I hadn't been aware of and that sounds very interesting and uh i uh i don't want to put my imprimatur on something because sometimes my fingerprints are not appreciated but i think iris idea wherever it goes is, is a good one and uh hopefully but mine is related to to cycling although it it has to do with present day infrastructure and it's simply a matter of signs or perhaps pavement markings and it, it's very low cost. The idea was simply to have um, the DPW acquire um, some signs that indicate that uh, cycling in the opposite direction on a designated counterflow bike lane, for example, on the west side of uh, Kendrick Park, which I think will soon be done uh, by DPW, but the thing is to acquire some signage which could be reutilized wherever such new facilities go in just to give a heads up to uh, motorists that they're not allowed but the cyclists I assume even e-cyclists could use that I don't think the cost would be very high and it'd be something that would be reusable wherever such facilities came in I know there have been suggestions to have other street systems made one way in part but it's very common especially in progressive European cities and even progressive American cities to have bicycling allowed both ways, even on a street that's one way. And I think this would be a, I think I forget what the amounts that I suggested were, but it was single digit thousand. And uh, the first place I thought we could try it would be on the west side of Kendrick Park on the southbound side. So it's actually the west side of the North Pleasant Street there as well. And um, yeah, I'm imagining, you know, a few at most a few dozen signs, maybe less than a dozen would be needed. And they'd be simple signs that uh, could be affixed to a simple signpost. And there might also be some funding for paint on the road, which isn't quite as durable, but which may also be uh, uh, appreciated by the DPW. And if you allow me to say that part of the reason for the request, even if it's in somewhere in the DPW's budget as just you know, error bars, this is a tiny amount of money. It's to make sure the project actually happens. It's something that I know uh, various other town council committees has have considered, the TAC has considered it. I think it's gonna happen. I was told through the grapevine that it's supposed to happen this summer, some of the work there on the west side. But I think getting the signs as an extra project will remind everybody that this is something that we could be doing and perhaps should be doing. Thank you. Questions? Mandy. Yeah, this is this is more for um, Sean to pass on to DPW. I can't easily find um, the plan that the council passed um, for that when we turned it one way and all the parking, but I 
feel like I remember we included a plan for a counterflow bike lane on that. So I think we would want some information on that as it relates to this and, you know, in terms of then the potential temporary nature of uh, Rob's request here, because I know there's some delays in the finalizing of the eventual plan for that street, but but if we could get some answers to that. So Mandy has a question, just whether that plan already included um, contract. Did it already include it? And then, and, and if it did, is it possible to do that part now too? You know, I, I, I think we might still have parking on both sides of the street right now, which might make it a little more problematic. I don't know, but um, can I, can I uh, offer? It's yeah. no the parking has been removed from the west side. Okay, so it was along, along yeah. the one way stretch. Yeah, so it, so just yeah. The, the idea, if I may, if I was just I, I don't know if I, I was to answer your question, but it, maybe it's for others. But I th I think the idea is that paint won't go down until the road is repainted. I mean, repaved, prepared, and curbs are reset, whatever. Signs could go in at any time and they could be taken away once there's something on the road that may be more attractive and, and then used elsewhere. And I, I, I can imagine other places in town, quite a few, I, I won't make a list of them, where, where one, a one-way and a counterflow bike lane the other way might actually be very appropriate, especially near the, the streets near the university that I think have that feature that uh, I could name a couple of them. Thanks. Sean, I'll call on myself. Um, that's okay. Um, I didn't know just, I was call, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was calling on people. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. Just the other thing to be asking DPW, but up by puffers when we made the road one way, it is clearly, there's some clearness and what I don't remember, you may know, Rob, that bikes are allowed to go in both directions and pedestrians are allowed to go in both directions, cars are not. So this is a place where um, foot traffic, it gets a little less traffic. Well, it only gets traffic in the summertime, but but it it's I think it's as a general question, I think it's a good one. You know, should we have clear signs that are permissive of the bikes? So they, un and that warns the cars that the, the bikes are going to go in two directions. Um, it's something everyone got used to pretty quickly, which was amazing. If, if I can come, there are two places near Puffer's Pond. One is the, uh, gee, I don't know whether it's Sand Hill Road or whatever the next road is, but it's, at, it's parallel to the Puffer's Pond Dam where bikes are asked to share the space with pedestrians. You don't want to hear me give an opinion about that. It's, it's right. not safe, but right. so it goes. People should slow down. The other part, which is State Street along the south side of Puffer's Pond, I don't remember what it does now for counterflow bike lane there, but that would be another place that I had in mind, actually. But it's obviously a remote place where, where signs like this might be deployed as appropriate. Because there it's not there, it's it's just paved roadways. These signs would be for on street, on the pavement, use of bicycles in the opposite direction. And presumably there'll be some kind of demarcation with a painted yellow line at some point, but it'd be very narrow on the bicycle side, you know, five or six feet wide. Anyway, it, it, the request is basically to put something in so they can create such signs. And if there's money left over from the signs to put some pa paint down once the new pavement is on the on the ground there and some of the signs could then go away as as people are habituated to the practice it's uh, okay. okay and as i said the signs could be deployed elsewhere as, as needed okay i don't see any other questions so um since we have others waiting in the queue thank you very much thank um, you too bye bye all right so i think our next um requester is jessica I, well, Jessica's coming in. I just want to let people know that something, something bad internet-wise happened as far as a uh, house, so she's off and unable to get back on and send her apologies. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, may I share my screen, please? Uh, uh, you okay with that? Kathy, I don't have any <laughs> issues. I just want to make sure you have the. Um, I, I think I to... can do it. One participant. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, 
I made visuals. I'm a visual person. Um, I am proposing a crosswalk um, to go across Pine Street um, at the corner of Harris Street in North Amherst uh, Village Center. The uh, To give you a view of the area, as you know, um, here's the traffic light and all of these roads go off to different parts of town and different towns. Um, the area that I really wanna talk about is right in the center of North Amherst Village. North Amherst Village has quite a few residents in it. Um, in this view, you can see that all of these apartment buildings and uh, places on North Pleasant Street um, are full of people who walk places. And when they walk and when they want to walk to um, say the Mill River Conservation Area or Puffer's Pond or down Pine Street to, to Cushman, they do, they mostly go up North Pleasant, North on North Pleasant Street, right turn right on Fisher Street and then follow Harris Street along and come to the end of Harris Street. And then what happens is there's no more, there's no more pavement for them to walk on without crossing Harris Street. You can see here, um, there's a sidewalk on the, the yellow line is the sidewalk on the north side of Pine Street. Um, and uh, I circle number 39 here because that's my house. This is where I live. <laughs> so I'm, I've got eyes on the ground here um, <laughs> for this problem. There are 10 to 15 people a day in the winter walk down Harris Street or cross from Pine Street onto Harris. Um, and in the summer, it can get up to 100 people a day. Um, runners, dog walkers, uh, baby pushers, um, people out just to have a nice walk. And, and they prefer to use Fisher and Harris streets because it's much more pleasant than walking up North Pleasant to Pine. Um, so that's the situation as it is right now. Um, safety is a really important issue. The red mark that I've put across Pine is where I suggest a crosswalk be. Um, I also, you can see that cars are going pretty fast when they go past this corner. Um, from the traffic light, they're accelerating through a 35 mile an hour zone to a 40 mile an hour zone right after Harris Street. So people are going faster and faster um, if they're going towards Cushman. If they're coming from Cushman, um, they're going 45 mile, 40 miles an hour or more until they get to Harris Street when they're supposed to slow down to 35. But you know, if that light is green, the slowing down doesn't happen. Um, so, it's not really safe for people to cross the street here, um, even though people do choose this unsafer way to go than the safer uh, pedestrian crossing at the traffic light. Um, the other, th this is the third time somebody's asked for this crosswalk. And um, the first two times, I believe my neighbor Nicola Usher was the um, was the requester, and um, I haven't I don't know the de this details of her request I know or why it was turned down, but um, I've heard that it's because um, one of the reasons is that there's not a sidewalk on the Harris side Harris Street side of Pine for a crosswalk to meet up with. But um, just as an offering of uh, perhaps a way to solve this problem is in the TAC uh, guide for um, uh, bicycle and pedestrian network for Amherst, um, they do put in a uh, suggestion of painted 
pedestrian lanes on neighborhood streets so that there's a demarcated pedestrian place for um, to guide um, walkers and it could the pedestrian lane could start at the end of the crosswalk and go all the way around um, on Harris to Fisher and uh, and terminate there and that would solve the problem of no sidewalk. No one wants to walk on the south side of Pine Street. They want to walk on Harris Street um, once they cross Pine or they want to work on, walk on Pine having come from Harris Street. Um, this, uh, you can see I've drawn in the <laughs> pedestrian lane here just to be more graphical. Um, putting a crosswalk on Pine Street here would fulfill um, some of the objectives of the master plan. Um, in the transportation section of the master plan, there's an um, objective uh, in T2, which is to actively promote alternative modes of transportation, which includes improve the safety and comfort of pedestrian spaces and paths which this would certainly do. I mean, I like to think of Harris and Fisher as multi-use paths rather than as streets because <laughs> there are as many pedestrians and bicyclists on it as there are cars um, on some days. Another um, one of the object, uh, sub subcategories of the T2 objective is to make village centers bicycle friendly and pedestrian friendly. Um, and that, which includes incorporating bike lanes, sidewalks, or multi-use paths, create and maintain well-marked pedestrian crossings and pedestrian activated traffic signals. Well, a well-marked pedestrian crossing right, right in this center of a North Amherst village would meet that objective. Um, so I do encourage uh, the town to um, at, to reward the walkers in North Amherst, to acknowledge that they should get the same uh, safety and um, safety acknowledgement and consideration that automobiles get who come bombing sometimes through North Amherst Village. Um, so I will stop now. Jessica, could you send me this um, if it, yeah. you know, if you have enough format? Can you send me this? I'll um, distribute it to the committee, and also it'll be helpful for the DPW superintendent to look at. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jessica. And uh, questions from the committee? Mandy. Yeah, thank you for it. Um, I just want to clarify, I believe your request initially said crosswalk, but you've got on the part we're actually looking at right now, sort of a pedestrian way that would also require some painting and all um, that could connect to the crosswalk. So is the request um, just the crosswalk or would it include the potential for adding this pedestrian way that you mentioned on both Harris and Fisher that might then connect to I don't know another cross. I don't know which side of the street the sidewalk is on at, at North Pleasant when Fisher hits it. Oh. Um, but yeah, so could you clarify sure. whether you're expanding it when, or not? <laughs> when I when I put in the request, the the resident request, um, I was thinking only crosswalk. But then as I learned about the previous requests and why they were denied. Um, I realized that we would probably need this pedestrian lane as well to, to act as a terminus for the south side of the crosswalk. Um, and that's why I've included it in this plan. I, I don't know if you want to include it as a, as a part of the plan or not. I'm happy, you know, the, the crosswalk itself is $30,000, um, which is what Sean told me. A couple of cans of paint um, I think we'll take care of the pedestrian um, pedestrian lane, um, and it 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 very nicely uh, 
Fisher Street has a crosswalk and sidewalk. Uh, North Pleasant Street crosses Fisher Street um, at that corner. So there's a sidewalk right there. Um, with a crosswalk painted on the street. <laughs> so um, there would, that would be a, a good terminus for the pedestrian lane. Pam. Thanks, I think this is a wonderful proposal. Um, it occurs to me that given, I, I drive that section quite a bit and given the attention on the upcoming um, intersection, it occurs to me that a, a more complete project would be to have something that allows a pedestrian to push a flashing light just for the safety of, um, the real safety, because I think people are pretty inattentive as they start to speed up, off to the right. east or speed to the light. Um, I, that was my intent. I, that's why I say I have a pedestrian activated light at crosswalk is my is my that's the goal yeah so the, my, so i think it would be i think it'd be helpful if the if the town staff does take a look at this particular one what does it add to the cost to add the pedestrian activated light um and i think that's it's part of the thirty thousand dollars okay I good it, yeah good I, that's what i was told okay I, I um, know, and, and i i have also gotten the same answer about um, you can't have a crosswalk to a street that doesn't have a sidewalk. Um, so I, I really like your idea of, of designating a pedestrian um, zone on Harris Street, even if it's actually not the entire length of the street, but perhaps the last 50 feet or something that, that gives you a landing, a landing point for the crosswalk. Well, I've been told that in order to be ADA compliant, there has to be a, a, a clearly marked sidewalk-ish kind of thing at either end of a crosswalk. And I so I thought, well, if somebody who needs some, some guidance comes across Pine Street onto Harris, they'd probably want to know that to go around the corner. So, but I, I agree, if it if it can be a shorter um, pathway, that's fine too. There's a, you know, there's a verge here <laughs> along Harris Street. <laughs> there's like a six foot verge, um, but I don't think we're gonna get a sidewalk anytime soon. Kathy? Um, so this is a little bit, it's not directly related to the sidewalk, but you showed 35 miles an hour coming off the traffic light going right away to 40. Um, one, yes. is, one of the issues in all directions here in my mind is shouldn't we have 25 miles an hour um, extended further because the description that she just gave of behavior is uh, absolutely accurate. Um, and it's, it's not safe because you also get fender benders um, as well as, so, so Sean, I just would wanna add a question on why is it 35, 25, why is it not 25 miles coming off the light? Because it is 25 miles going north. Um, so that, that's a good question for the TAC, I think. Uh, well, <laughs> here, I'll tell you, because I asked that question too, when they repaved the road um, in 2014, there had been a 25 mile an hour sign at the corner of North, you know, on Pine Street for people going to Cushman, right at the corner. And when, after the painting was done and the signs went back up, there's a 35 mile an hour, hour sign. I said, well, this doesn't make sense. And I was told by the director of the Department of Public Utilities um, that that was the right one. And that if we wanted to get that changed, we would have to call, call the state and they would have to do a traffic survey <laughs> and they would probably come up with a faster speed limit. So that's along P Pine and Mart. Those are state roads. Pine. No, no, no. But that's okay. What well, 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 Sean, we could throw that into the mix because if they're not state roads, yeah. it's not accurate. And I actually succeeded in getting the speed limit on Montague roads lowered. The state agreed with me. So, 
they didn't so so but if it's not a state road it's under town control so i just want to put that into the mix because yeah, it, again guilford can weigh in on that again i don't think it directly right. relates to this um yeah it doesn't that part but, doesn't but we can um certainly get that answered okay all right thank you jessica thanks jessica. Oh, you're very welcome. all right our next is kathleen carroll i'm going to promote you Kathleen, you're, I think you're with us if you unmute. Hi there, I'm Kathleen Carroll. I live at 11 Fisher Street and I have submitted on behalf of uh, my neighbors on Fisher Street, the proposal for speed humps. So I have lived here for 13 years and the the reason for the request is totally related to safety of the residents who live here. And, and also, as you can see from Jessica's map, um, the residents who live on Harris Street. So the, the, the L of Harris and Fisher is used as a shortcut for commuters who are trying to avoid the light. So the way the North Pleasant and Pine are situated, they can see whether the light is green or red by the time they hit Harris or the, the time they hit Fisher. So they will quickly take a left or a right onto um, Harris and Fisher and go quickly down uh, either street to avoid uh, hitting a yellow or red light. So, as I said, I have been here for 13 years, and when I first moved in, I had my grandchildren, my young grandchildren here quite a bit, and I took it upon myself to um, put birdseed into the road during commuter hours to deter um, motorists uh, going down the street. The, the squirrels and the birds would go into the street and it would slow them down. So um, time went on and birdseed got expensive. So then I have turned and I still do um, the little orange cones that you can buy at Walmart. So I um, usually do all that during the academic year when the, the traffic is the worst. So I think I, I have no basis for the price. I think for Fisher Street, maybe um, one hump might be enough. And I've also noticed over the years um, that it's the same cars that will eventually, that do use it as a shortcut. And once they find out that they can't go through um, our two streets as quickly as they think they can, I think it would be um, an excellent deterrent. So I, I do wanna mention that there is a concern by myself and um, some other neighbors about uh, the engineering of a hump or humps um, as it relates, relates to drainage of the water, of the rain water. Um, when they redid Harris and Fisher uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, they did a wonderful job. We do not have sidewalks, um, as Jessica uh, mentioned, um, but the the slope of the street, um, uh, what happens is when we have an extreme rain, which seems to be more and more often, the water will go into uh, the yards on the south side of Fisher, and um, drain down into the yards and it is a problem. So I would hope the engineers could um, take a look at the drainage issue if this uh, proposal is considered. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. Questions? You know, Sean, when I was looking forward, are we talking about potential speed hump on Fisher and then one also on Harris? I mean, when you look at the two, 
and, and are they separate? Do you want me to bring in Jeremy and have maybe it makes sense to do those two together? And yeah, I just you know I just you know we you saw the way the map does. Yeah, one on each of them. They were two it, separate requests, but I could. Are you okay if I bring in Jeremy and have him speak to? Sure. I just I just thought so people would know what's coming, but maybe Pam wants to start off on the idea of the speed hump. Yeah. Pam, is your question one that you would ask of both? Um, um, yeah, I, actually, it's more of a statement that that I um, totally get the the need for speed bumps on cut through streets. Cottage Street was also a cut through street, and our our two humps um, have been very successful in managing that traffic. So it's I would strongly support a safety measure like that. I think Jeremy, it is a different issue, Sean. I'm just looking. Um, oh yeah, it's tra traffic signs. Yeah. Yeah, so Kathleen, will you tell you, I, I'm just asking, so I know, are we talking about a hump on Fisher and then a hump on Harris, or do you think one is enough? There's two separate proposals submitted, and I do not think, um, I think, well, I think one is enough on Fisher. I, I don't know what the engineers would say about Harris because it is a, a longer street. Okay. Um, but I think there's somebody on here to talk about the proposal for the speed humps on Harris. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alex. Thanks. So myself living on a cut through North Prospect Street, <laughs> I'm very familiar with the uh, the speed one can get to between the bend on Halleck and, uh, and Coles. It's shocking actually. Um, is there, I don't know from a cost wise perspective, but I know it's something we talk about on our street is, you know, if you were to change the street to a one-way street, we also have the nonsense that is coals. But I, I wonder if changing it to a one-way street is any more cost-effective and would it solve it or does it only solve, you know, one direction? And I'm just throwing it out there because I have no idea if one's equally effective but different in terms of cost. I can no fire write that down the for- The fire department um... doesn't love humps. That's all I <laughs> have in my mind is the fire department hates humps, so. <laughs> I can write that down for Guilford. Does a uh, one-way help with traffic uh, or speed? Mandy. Yeah, um, this one's not for Kathleen. It's more for when we get these reports from Guilford. I think a report that includes all of the requests for these two streets, the crosswalk, the humps on both Harris and Fisher, um, to talk about sort of that and how it relates to any plan that might happen at the Pines, the five way intersection, however you want to call it, like, so that we can look at it all holistically almost, you know, and, and also then how it relates, how it could relate to the planned improvements to North Pleasant Street that I believe TSO at one point was looking at or still has on its Kathy, you remember, like, there's that massive, some massive proposal for new sidewalks and changes of sidewalks and all that we had last term that I think is still sitting in TSO right now. Um, you know, how any of this would relate to that. Yeah, and I, and I can tell you because I know that one is somehow it came out of DPW and ignored the fact that where there aren't sidewalks and there weren't crosswalks. They rearranged the existing ones. Um, but yes, it, it didn't get all the way up to this intersection. I mean, it did, but it didn't change. So that would be great to include them as a cluster. Good. Um, any other questions? Kathleen, thank you very much. All right, so next is Jeremy. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. Uh, Jeremy Anderson. I live at 34 High Point Drive in Amherst, and I have two sons, Eric, who's five and just started at Fort River, and Wesley, who is three and is at Cushman Scott. Uh, both boys, uh, well, Eric was at Cushman until he started at Fort River, and, and Wesley is currently at Cushman. And since, uh, you know, since we were able to get Eric um, at Cushman in 20, probably 2019, I've been in communications with the police department and with the Department of Public Works about 
a, a similar topic, uh, addressing speed and addressing traffic concerns. Uh, you know, here it's it's right in front of the Cushman School. Uh, it's you know it's, it's a very tight area as to, as people are driving through. They're coming from um, from Northeast Street, and and they kind of just zip right through the intersection uh, on their way northbound, or even coming southbound. Um, it's, it's as as the other uh, requests have said, it's it's amazing the speed that people can can get in in a very short period of time. Uh, so, you know, I've I've been working with. Uh, Chief of Police Scott Livington, who's been really fantastic and, and very, very accommodating, uh, with with Guilford Mooring at, at the Department of Public Works to try to find some some alternatives um, and and part of again trying to find some holistic um, options. And, and one request that that the request that I have is for those uh, signs that say your your speed is. Um, this is something that uh, Scott provided quotes for for eighty five hundred dollars per per sign. These would be solar paneled. It'd be positioned on the, the telephone poles in front of the school in both the, the north and southbound direction. Just to remind people, uh, it's so easy in, in the mornings, especially during the drop off for kids, people are trying to get to work. Um, and, and the police department has been incredibly helpful providing uh, officers occasionally to, to look at the traffic. Um, and, and so my hope is that these signs are just another tool uh, to help help remind people to, to slow down um, and, and hopefully, you know, protect our, our, our little ones who are our most vulnerable members of our community. Thank you, Scott, Jeremy. Any questions? And Mandy. This one's actually for Guilford because he's gonna know what these signs are, but um, you said solar powered and solar powered is awesome. I'm curious, um, is there any, are they completely, for Guilford, are they completely contained electrical signs, meaning you don't need to hook into some other electrical system, you can just take the sign, pour your concrete pad, bolt it down, or whatever you do, you know, or do you have to have an electric supply outside of the sign and solar panel? Um, because I assume the work required is a lot different depending on whether you have to hook into an external electrical supply or whether the entire post sign type system is fully contained and operational on its own. And um, I would I'll just ask to also um, ask Chief uh, Livingston as well, because he's the one who, who provided the quotes for the installation. Mm -hmm. Alex. Alex. Yeah, and I guess just along that, just sort of, again, sort of more holistically, I mean, I, I know at one point there was a request on our street, so I, we had that sign for a bit, and it does work, but then when <laughs> I went away, it stopped working. So um, I don't know how long they work for, but they, you know, I don't know whether we have a supply that we, you know, use for when there are traffic studies that are being done, or... Oh. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I was thinking the the, the permanent ones, um, <laughs> not not the temporary trailer ones. But yes, I completely agree. When when they're there, you're like, oh, I got to slow down. When they're not there, oh no, okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so this would be a permanent um, fixture. Yeah, and I guess I'm just curious how many of the temporary ones we have, and do we only deploy those for? Are you talking the temporary ones, like the ones that have wheels at police station yeah, sets? Yeah. I think they have yeah. six I mean, of them. Oh, okay. um yeah and, and i don't think i mean maybe they're the ones i'm thinking about they're not often used for speed i mean they could be used for speed but i think they're often used for messages and um communicating other information i think they do speed as well but i've seen them most often for like as you enter downtown to communicate health and safety information yeah i mean i guess i'm thinking just more from the holistic view right again you know uh pam you're new to this committee but my resounding theme is always around equity and right who who knows that this exists, who, you know, has the time and the ability to come to the table and um, make these requests. And I wholeheartedly feel your signage need. And, but what other, like, is this something we need to study and do we need to prioritize where these signs should go? Like, you know, near Cushman where there's a school, like that seems like a priority. So we put one there, but you know, maybe, I don't know, but I just wonder whether this is, as other capital requests that have come is more of a, this is an issue we have throughout town and should we study it holistically and not just for the people who have the privilege to be able to bring it to our attention? 
which I appreciate, by the way. <laughs> or, yeah, I, I agree with what you said, Alex, because it's it is an issue throughout town on a number of different streets in a number of different areas. And it would be good if we could collect the information and put it together into one capital uh, proposal that Guilford uh, um, could bring forward to us. But somehow other people have to be that know that we are going to go through this process. Because believe me, the streets that I've heard of now, are, there are more that have the same kinds of issues and, and that uh, could use speed bumps or signage. You know, in the past, uh, speed bumps have been uh, frowned upon, uh, especially by the fire department. Uh, so it's an issue of if, if speed bumps are an issue for the fire department, how severe of an issue is it versus a safety issue uh, for the, the community that is involved. Yeah, so I will, the theme I'm hearing is general feedback from Guilford about safety improvements townwide and how, you know, is our process to kind of come back with a plan for everything while also considering the specific requests that have been submitted. And if, if I may follow up um, on both of those points from, from Irv and from Alex, uh, I, I have had, and I've, this has been incredibly helpful for me to hear everyone's thoughts for, for my proposal and, and for the previous ones. I, I think speeding in, in Amherst is a problem, but it, it's not just an Amherst problem. It, it's a problem everywhere. Uh, and um, I, you know, from the conversations I've had, it sounded like changing speed limits wasn't an option um, because I was told the same thing as, as the previous uh, request that, that this was state owned or these were state mandated speed limits. So I think there might be more, um, you know, just more information <laughs> that could be provided about what are options for residents. Uh, you know, can can we get lower speed limits across the town, or can we, you know, when are when are crosswalks available? Because uh, the residents along Henry Street and Pine Street, um, I was we were given a folder of, of about 15 years of communications where they were advocating for for something, and, and you know, and so definitely, you know, it's it's, it's a problem in, in our town, and I appreciate anything you can do to help. Thank you, Jeremy. All right, so the next request is for the Valley Bike Station, and I believe it's Arthur and Meg Gage who are gonna speak to that. Hey, Arthur, hello. Hi. Wait, I gotta start my video, there I am. Hi, everyone. Should we start? Yes, thank you for your time. Um, my name is Arthur Haskins. I have worked in um, Amherst, in uh, um, North Amherst for many years. I've um, handled the development in North Square at the Mill District um, from the inception to the lease up. I handled personally and managed the buildings until very recently. Um, <clears throat> I um, am here to advocate for the Valley Bikes Initiative um, in regard to adding the continuation of the Valley Bikes um, to the North Amherst, to the Mill District, Coles Road area. Um, today we have a, a, a void. Um, I handled the affordable housing lease up at North Square, for example, and I personally um, had many residents that were relocating to the area. Um, and had a very strong need um, for uh, to uh, reduce reliance on on automobiles, and this coincides, of course, as well with the sentiments of uh, some of the folks who've spoken earlier in regard to the environmental impact of lessening reliance on fossil fuels and and uh, lessening emissions. Um, we have a strong proposal uh, right now. We're we're seeing a couple of paths for the continuation of the valley bikes. And um, one of the uh, um, two potential paths forward is a station that is um, not uh, um, with, with bikes, uh, which would be um, one option, but it, uh, more ideally, a six uh, dedicated bike station um, would be ideal to help enhance the community. Um, some located somewhere central to the entire North Amherst Mill District community. 
um, where it would allow for folks to be able to have another option for commuting and would create a natural path in joining the other valley bike stations already in place for the proprietary e-bikes um, through the uh, through the Amherst corridor. Uh, today, we have an increase in our population in North Amherst. Uh, uh, one example, of course, is North Square, but there are other projects in the pipeline, Pulpit Hill, and, uh, and just in general, the, the population's um, increasing. And, uh, and then also an increased reliance on uh, potentially on automobiles, which we'd like to counter. The um, North Square Comprehensive Permit, um, one of the conditions was for traffic studies and for understanding um, studies related to, for example, Zipcar, which today I feel is out of date. Um, I think this is a much more impactful uh, approach to um, help lessen the reliance on fossil fuels to increase that ability to access, for example, the um, North Amherst Library project is underway, and once that's complete, this would help with the access for folks uh, between um, the North Amherst area proper and downtown. And um, in addition to, we've been able to ob obtain uh, um, private investment uh, to match the potential capital investment um, dollar for dollar in order to place a Valley Bike Station. Um, I will defer to Meg for um, some of the details. I'm rather um, new. My colleague had put together a very comprehensive application narrative, and I fully um, um, support this, this initiative. Um, and Meg, Thanks. I'm just seeing we're running up near to three o'clock, so try to make it super succinct. <laughs> okay. There's, there's one more person after you. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you have a speaker for the Harris Street speed hump, but Lisa Boniface yes. is available. Yes. Okay, um, I'll be, uh, thank you everyone. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I wanna say, first of all, that this project and the Harris Street, Fisher Street projects and the crosswalk were created with a, through a collaboration of the District One Neighborhood Association and uh, the Mill District in our efforts to strengthen the village center uh, of North Amherst. I wanna suggest that we think of these projects as well as frankly, all the projects that have been proposed in the context of the three massive planning documents that we have created and approved at great effort, the master plan, the sustainability plan, and the transportation plan that involved dozens and dozens of staff, uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours and many volunteers to create and approve. And the, these three plans are not gonna be advanced by any single big humongous thing like a new school. They are gonna take uh, policies, uh, regulation changes, I'm speeding through this as fast as I can, changes in behavior by everyone in the town. And I feel we need to focus on those things more than we tend to. All of these projects advance those three plans. Uh, and I won't, because of the time, go into the details of each one, but the Valley Bikes Project uh, is an important uh, way of connecting our part of town with the rest of the town. And um, the uh, Ball Lane Project that I think Arthur may have referred to at Pulpit Hill oh, is sorry. a new uh, affordable housing uh, that's, that's gonna be built very soon. We have nine apartment complexes in North Amherst, nine, and, uh, all of these projects are designed in order to advance safety, conservation, pedestrians, and bicycles. Uh, and I was going to say a little more, but I won't. I'll just say cars go by. We live on Montague Road. It's 35 miles an hour, but they go by at 60 miles an hour very often because they're zooming into town or zooming out. Uh, and I'll say on uh, one little anecdote, I don't know if Derek Shea is going to be able to speak, but He's driven home, he lives on Harris Street, and while driving home once was passed by a speeding car on Harris Street. I mean, it's crazy how fast the cars go on those streets. Um, and I think that this particular project, just say one last thing, the particular project, um, I don't see how you can turn down the Valley Bikes thing when we have $20,000 pledged to match uh, what the town would come up with. Uh, it's a kind of a no brainer in my opinion. Thank you all. I really appreciate uh, this program. Thank, Thank you. you. Finally, I, 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 I apologize. 
If I may add just one quick note uh, that the maintenance and the uh, overall electric costs are also something that um, we've had pledged as well. So that this would be a very, I think a very strong and easy lift for uh, potentially improving the, the community. And Arthur, didn't you say that you sometimes have to pick up valley bikes and <laughs> that you find strewn around the mill district and return Absolutely. them? So I, I am I'm still in the mill district. I'm no longer formally with Beacon Communities. I'm, uh, I handle all the real estate and development for WD Coles. But um, in my time at uh, Beacon, working for uh, Beacon at the, handling the North Square project, there was many times where my maintenance staff would be finding valley bikes and uh, sometimes having to return them in our in our vehicles. Um, but essentially, if we can have a, a station that is increasing the e-bike inventory, that would allow the option for commuters to be able to have um, some reliability to, to know that there would be potentially available units for them to use and, and take to commute in and out of the other sections of the Amherst Corridor. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I want to make, we if there are questions, um, Mandy's got them, um, and then we have one more proposal. Yeah, I'll be quick and I don't expect answers today. Um, how does, I, I'm curious about how the funding works for all the stations we currently have. Has it been a joint town Valley bikes initiative? So just the next time we talk about that, um, the ongoing operating costs, I think Arthur covered a little bit, but I'd like more information as to who would cover those. Cause I imagine there might be ongoing operating costs. Um, and is this something that a transportation fund instead of the capital program is could could fund, you know, irrespective of whether there's money in the transportation fund right now, because I know we've got some issues with that, but is this a type of project and a type of capital spending that transportation funds funds could be used for now or in the future, depending on the size of the fund? Yeah, can I respond real quickly? Because there was one thing I wanted to add. Um, so and Stephanie ha uh, Ciccarello has provided a little bit of feedback on this proposal already. Um, so the original plan for the Valley Bikes, there's two additional locations that are part of that original plan um, that haven't don't have stations currently. One is the one that is being proposed here. And then the other one is down near Atkins. And that would kind of complete the original network. Um, so the initial reaction from Stephanie mm -hmm. was positive towards this um, request. Uh, the way they're, f so we have to pay to put the station in place um, and Valley Bikes is something that's done as sort of a, a community collaboration with Northampton um, and I think one of the, some other communities. Uh, Northampton actually manages it. So there is an operational impact. Um, it's not huge, but there is an operational impact that we have to, we pay basically per station or per, you know, the based on usage. Um, so adding this station or another station would have some ongoing cost impact. Um, but it is again, something, uh, I think we're looking for ways to kind of complete that plan, both the one at Atkins and the one here. Um, and we do have a little bit of, uh, talking with Stephanie, we have a little bit of grant funding left as well. Um, which might be able to take care of the the one down near Atkins. Um, so again, Stephanie, will, uh, I hope will be at one of the upcoming meetings. She can speak to it more, but um, it was viewed positively from her part. Thank you. And then I just want to check that everyone can stay for a few more minutes. Lerv said he had to leave he can, because we have one more resident proposal. Does that work for everyone? So we don't have quorum anymore, um, which what, might are be we a down, are we one, two, Three. Do we have quorum still? Maybe we do. So we have seven. No, we have seven. We still have quorum. Yeah. My bad. I, think, I think we're right on the edge of. I've got I've got CPA nine in my head. Yeah, I no, no, I think we're right on the edge. So I think we have just enough. If we can say just for a few more minutes, does that work? Yeah, I'm taking meeting. I have a meeting at three. I've already told him I'm running late, but I says the meeting minute taker. I feel like I feel like okay. I need to stay, but <laughs> okay. So Sean, let's bring in Alyssa and. Lisa, you are here if you unmute. Hi, I'm wondering if I could share my screen. You can, uh, but um, but we do have limited time and I'm sorry that we, if, if you need more time, picture. we could schedule for a future meeting. As yeah, well. well, it's just a picture would give a thousand. Yeah, words, sure, really. uh, you, you um, have access to share it. It's it's the setting is- um, It's a little one down at the bottom. Okay, and I'll do it right now. Okay, do you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, like um, it says, do not enter except bicycles. 
You have yes. a visual there? Great. My name is Lissa Pierce Bonifaz. I live on Harris Street. I was the uh, composer, I guess, of the proposal that you all are have in your hands. Um, as a, I wish that we could have recorded the, the discussion we had with the Transportation Committee because we had probably nine members of our community speak out. Um, in favor of the speed humps. Since we have written that proposal, I think we did that in December, um, we've had a lot of discussions, really helpful discussions with a lot of people in town, especially in the Transportation Committee. Um, Eve Vogel sent me this picture, actually, if I pronounced her name right, and I thought this looked like a very interesting solution to our speed hump problems. So I'm actually here to say that I might even have a better idea than the speed humps which is to create a one way on Harris and Fisher with a, um, as you can see in that picture, there is a pedestrian lane um, where the bicycles can go the opposite way. Um, maybe one low bump at one side would, uh, would make it clear and make it clear that bicycles can go in the counter flow direction might be um, our solution to a lot of these problems. The crosswalk could then have a pedestrian lane. Um, a one-way traffic would be half as much of the traffic coming down our streets. Um, it may slow people down as well if it's only one lane. Um, so I'm just putting that in there as a new idea for you all to consider. We do not have the solution. We're just coming up with all sorts of ideas. I know you all are the engineers. You know how to make this happen. Um, I just want to say uh, to finalize that this is a critical issue. This is a life and death issue. I'm telling you, we in the last call, a little girl on our street almost lost her life. Derek Shea had to throw his body in front of the car to keep it from hitting her. Last night, I was with my dog on that L shape, that little L corner. Um, I heard a car revving on Fisher Street coming on to Harris. I couldn't get my dog fast enough across the road. So we were in the middle of the road when he zoomed around us. I screamed like I've never screamed before. And I just want you all to hear that because this is a critical issue. And at the, at the end of the day, if someone really gets hurt, who's liable? And we've come to you many times now about these issues and it has not been addressed and it's getting worse and you've heard it many times. And I wanna make sure that you really take it seriously. It's a serious life and death issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lissa. So Sean, we have, as I understand that we have an initial idea and an amended idea, both of yeah. which came up on the other issue too about one way. So I think we need to, to get a discussion on that when we come back, yeah. Do you wanna do a really quick public comment just to see if there's any okay. public comment? Is there any member of the public? Um, I see, Meg's hand is up, two people are up, Meg and Mary. Okay. I'm gonna bring in Mary just cause she hasn't spoken yet. Mary, I'm gonna promote you as a panelist. You just have to hit the accept on it and it'll bring you in. There you go. And now you just have to unmute and you can go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanna say I've lived on Pine Street since 1988 and it's got progressively worse. And I just wanna really uh, want this committee to, to look carefully at all these proposals. And I would hope that it isn't put off until the five-way intersection is dealt with because that intersection has been being dealt with for 35 years and um, the District One Neighborhood Association really pushed to get the lights changed and that has helped. But for us to wait until a grant is done and we figure out what we're gonna do there before we do other safety measures, I think would be a, um, really problematic. So um, that whole area is very unsafe. And um, I really hope the town will look at it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm bringing Meg in one more time in case she has public comment. Uh, super quickly, uh, this proposal for the Harris Street 
changes. The, the speed bump proposal was developed by a group of neighbors in a series of conversations. So that proposal is still the proposal that we're also considering. I think Lissa's idea is a creative one uh, that I hadn't heard before, but I think I want you to not discard the proposal for the speed hump, uh, although a comprehensive solution to that whole area would be wonderful. This, these were projects developed through conversations and meetings with neighbors and a process. Thank it's you, possible we didn't come up with the best plan, but we think we did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your, thank you. Sorry, I cut Meg off there a little bit. <laughs> I, I think Meg was saying thank you. Uh, sorry. So I, I wanna thank the committee. Um, I see Mary's hand is still up, but I, I right now I think we, we just went over and I thank you all for staying extra. And Sean, I'll, I'll talk with you afterwards that whether we wanna on, on one of the future agendas come back to this set or you figure out how so that we don't have right. just a circular pattern on it, it would be great. Okay. So if everyone is fine on the committee, I'm gonna say that we are adjourned at, 311. So thank you thank very you. much for staying over. <laughs>